three, two. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for tonight's breast lecture series presented by Dr. Gilda Borman, where we will have the pleasure to hear all about breast imaging basics of mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. We're so fortunate to hear about breast imaging from one of our fellowship trained breast radiologists. As you know, the radiology department is the first step for many women into the healthcare arena. This is where the majority of women come year after year to hopefully hear your mammogram is normal, all is good, see you next year. This requires an expertise to read images and determine the fate of many women's health. An expert radiologist reduces the mortality from breast cancer by detecting cancer at an early stage. As I just said, it is exciting to, and to be able to say it again, that our community is fortunate to have breast imaging fellowship trained physicians reading imaging at the Newark Radiology Mammography Center, right next door to our breast surgeons. Dr. Boramon received her Bachelor of, Bachelor of Arts and medical degree from New York University in New York City. She completed her internal medicine residency at Yale New Haven Hospital and completed a second diagnostic radiology residency at the Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. And if that wasn't enough, she returned and completed a breast imaging fellowship at Yale Medicine in New Haven. So when I say that patients are fortunate, I'm serious that they are receiving the expertise from physicians that hold breast imaging fellowships. Dr. Boramon has received several honors and awards. She has also published and has provided presentations on screening mammography and digital breast tomosynthesis. Dr. Boramond is a member of the American College of Radiology, American Rankin Ray Society, and the Society of Breast Imaging. It is our pleasure to have her on our staff at Norwalk Radiology Mammography Center and with us this evening to share breast imaging basics of mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. Dr. Boramond, welcome. Thank you, Mary. You are really much too kind. Um, so I, <laughs> I hope that um, my talk tonight will be helpful and informative for some people. Um, I thought I would just sort of spend my time talking about really the basics of what I do all day, every day, um, which is look at a mix of mammograms, ultrasounds, and MRIs. Um, that's really the bulk of what we do in breast imaging. And so I thought it might be helpful for people to understand a little bit about what it is that we look at. Um, so why um, do we care about breast cancer? Just some background quickly. Um, as some of you may know, it is the most common cancer that's diagnosed in women throughout the world. About one in eight women will actually be diagnosed in their lifetime. Um, and in the United States, it's the leading cause of premature death. So it's obviously something that we care a lot about. And there is a lot of research out there that has shown that early detection of breast cancer, so finding it when it's small, when it hasn't spread, um, that that improves outcomes, that women do better. And so that's why I do what I do. And I don't want to spend too much time on this point, but I just wanted to show you really quickly um, to dispel one of the, I don't know if it's if myth is the correct word, but maybe misconception um, about screening mammography and why it's so important. Um, there are some misconceptions out there that it's really not so much the screening with mammograms, but maybe the treatment um, and the improved um, surgery and chemotherapy and radiation that really has made a difference in improved outcomes for women. But what I do want to stress is that screening mammograms have played an important role. Um, the graph that you're looking at shows breast cancer mortality or the number of deaths from breast cancer um, starting in the late 60s going through the um, almost today. And you can see that the mortality or the death rate was about constant or about the same through the 60s, 70s, 80s. And it really started to dip 
um, when screening mammography became commonplace, was introduced and women started having screening mammograms. And you can see that since about 1989, we've actually decreased the mortality rate from breast cancer by 42%, which is a really staggering number. Um, some of this is related to improvements in treatment, but a good portion of this is also due to early detection. So that's why I do what I do. We try to find breast cancer when it's smaller, when it hasn't spread, when it's easier to treat. Um, so just first to talk about mammograms. Um, we do what are called screening mammograms and also diagnostic mammograms. Um, the difference really is uh, related to whether or not the patient has any symptoms. So a screening mammogram is for a woman who has no symptoms whatsoever. They're really just coming in for their regular checkup. Um, most of those times, the women will come in uh, whenever is convenient for them. They will have their images taken by the technologist. And most of the time, they go home and they get the results later, um, whether it's by a phone call or by letter at home. Um, we do have some patients who would like to have us read their mammograms while they're there. Um, and I should actually backtrack and say that I work at the iPark building in Norwalk. And so in our office, if a woman would like us to read her mammogram while she's there, we do everything that we can to accommodate that. Um, sometimes there are two of us who work there at, on any given day. Sometimes if we're both in the middle of a procedure, um, we may not be able to read the mammogram right then and there. Um, but if a woman asks, we try our best to read them while they're there. Um, so that's a screening mammogram. That's really for someone who um, doesn't have any symptoms. Like I said, no concerns. They just want to get their sort of regular checkup. Um, the other type is what's called a diagnostic mammogram. It's when a woman has any symptoms, any concerns, be that that they're feeling a lump, um, that they're having nipple discharge, um, changes in the skin of the breast, uh, pain we see a lot. Um, so any sort of symptom, or it can be, um, this doesn't happen that often, but sometimes someone will get, for example, a chest CT, and there may be something in the breast that's questioned on the chest CT, then a mammogram would be um, useful in that case. So sometimes we see women in that setting. Um, or if we're following any finding, uh, that's also when we would do a diagnostic mammogram. The difference really is that for every single diagnostic mammogram, the breast imager reviews those mammograms while the patient is there. So they do have to wait a little bit after the images are taken by the technologist for the radiologist to go over the images. Um, sometimes we may ask for extra pictures. Um, sometimes we may also do an ultrasound. And then once all of the imaging has been done, um, the radiologist will speak with the patient about the findings. And so you always get results while you're there in our office. So what exactly is a mammogram? Um, basically, it's a special type of x-ray. It's not like an x-ray of, you know, any other body part, let's say like of your chest, you know, your lungs or your abdomen or your bones. Um, it's very specific just for the breast um, in that we use special techniques to significantly lower the radiation. So the radiation from a mammogram is much, much, much lower than the radiation from any other type of x-ray. Um, it's hard to you know, make this sort of very clear. I think it's confusing for women how much radiation a mammogram is. Um, one way that I like to explain it is that having a screening mammogram where we image both breasts is about similar to um, taking a transatlantic flight, so flying to Europe. It's about the same amount of radiation. Or it's similar to if you lived at altitude, so if you live in Denver, it's about the same amount of radiation as you would get from having a screening mammogram. So while we do want to minimize radiation, um, I want women to sort of feel assured that really the radiation from a mammogram is not a lot. Um, it's not something that should, in my mind, prevent them from getting a mammogram. And there has been no evidence of um, screening mammograms ever causing a breast cancer. Um, one thing I also wish that people could understand, because I think it would help, um, I know that mammograms are not fun for anybody. Um, I know that they're not comfortable. 
Um, I know that women would prefer to not have them. And that's mostly, I think, related to the compression. The physical discomfort um, can be bothersome. And I do want people to understand the reason why we do compression and the reason why it's so important is that one, it helps us see the tissue better, but also it helps lower the radiation dose. Um, so compression, as uncomfortable as it is, there's a reason for the madness, um, a reason why we do it that way. And one, one of the reasons why is that it helps lower radiation dose. The other really important reason is that it helps us see a lot better. Um, it spreads out the tissues so we can see everything that we're looking for on a mammogram, we can see better when there's better compression. Um, so just some basics of what the mammogram actually entails. We get two views, two pictures of each breast, so four pictures total. Um, the pictures have specific names. We call them the CC view, which is, and the MLO view. Not necessarily things that, you know, the average person needs to know, but it's important for us. Um, so those are the two views that we get for a screening mammogram. For a diagnostic mammogram, if there is something in particular that we're looking at, a particular part of the breast, we may do extra pictures if we need to. We don't always, for a diagnostic mammogram, have to get more than the regular four pictures, but sometimes they can be helpful. And so this schematic on the bottom just is a cartoon showing the four basic pictures that we get um, in total, two of each breast. And this is an example of what two of those pictures would look like. Um, on the left side of the screen here is the right breast, and on the right side of the screen is the left breast. Us radiologists sort of look at things backwards. Um, this is the MLO view that the technologist takes. And if you look at the cartoon, the schematic here on the upper right of the screen, um, this is trying to show how the technologist is positioning the breast to take this picture. And you can see the picture is taken sort of at a slant on the breast. Um, the reason they do this is to try to capture the most amount of breast tissue here. And the radiologist evaluates their own pictures, or sorry, the technologist. After they've taken the picture, they will quickly look at it to make sure that they've done a good job. If they need to, they may take an extra picture. Um, and then when us radiologists look at the pictures on our computers, we're making sure before we even really start looking at the pictures in detail, we're first making sure that a good image was taken. So just some things that you can see here on this mammogram. Um, this band of sort of lighter gray, this is the muscle. This is the chest wall muscle. This is actually the pec. So this is the pectoralis muscle. We wanna make sure that we can see that on every MLO view because it makes us know for sure that we got a good amount of the breast tissue in our picture. Up here in the very top of this picture, these are actually lymph nodes up in the armpit. So we do image part of the armpit um, for every woman who has a mammogram. Um, this here is the breast tissue and this is the nipple here. So some things that we're looking for, we wanna make sure that the muscle was caught in the picture. Um, we wanna make sure that we came as far down as possible in the breast, that we didn't miss a portion of the bottom of the breast. We wanna make sure that the nipple is um, in what we call in profile, meaning it's pointing straight out, it's not off to the side. Um, and we wanna make sure that there's no blur, no motion on the picture, and that's what compression helps for. And so this is the other set of views that we get. Um, in this uh, schematic, you can see in the top right, the technologist has compressed the breast from top and bottom and taken this picture. Again, we wanna make sure that we see as much of the breast tissue as possible, that we have the nipple again in profile. Um, and again, for every picture that the technologist takes, we're looking to make sure that there's no motion or blurring. Um, and we wanna make sure that we got as much of the breast tissue as is possible. Um, if you ever come in for a mammogram and the technologist takes an extra picture, it may be because they noticed part of the breast was not imaged well and so they may take an extra picture to make sure that they got everything. It's really important for us um, that the technologists do a good job and they position the patient well because we want to make sure that we see as much of the breast tissue as we can. 
Um, again, just to reiterate, uh, for a diagnostic mammogram, which is when someone has symptoms usually, um, we may get additional pictures if we need to. Um, some of the pictures that we get often are um, magnification views is what they're called. That's when we're looking at calcifications, which are tiny little white dots on the mammogram. Um, or we may do an as, um, other special pictures where we focus really on a smaller portion of the breast. We don't look at the full breast, but we sort of hone in on a small section. Those really happen on a case by case basis after we review the first four initial set of pictures. We may have the technologist take extra pictures. Um, this is an example of what some mammograms look like. Um, you've probably heard about breast density. I want to speak about that for a few minutes because it's really important. Um, so what does breast density mean? It really refers to how the breast looks on a mammogram. It's not something that we can feel on a physical exam. Um, it really has nothing to do with what the breast feels like. It's really just what it looks like on a mammogram. Um, and it refers to how much whiteness there is on the mammogram. Um, so in these pictures, for example, Patients A and B, we would consider not dense, and patients C and D, we would say that they are dense. And the reason is that in C and D, you can see there's a lot more white in this picture than there is in A and B. The white, um, or it's really a shade of gray, but basically the white, I'll refer to it, is um, the breast tissue. So the breast is made up of fibroglandular tissue and fatty tissue. Um, a woman who has dense breast tissue will have more of this fibroglandular tissue, which is what makes it look white, compared to fatty tissue, which looks more gray. Um, the reason this is important is that, so normal breast tissue looks white, but also breast cancer can look white or does look white. So if there is more of this normal fibroglandular or this normal dense breast tissue, it can make it harder to read a mammogram. It can make it harder to spot a new mass or a cancer because it would be white on top of white. Um, so that's why we care about breast density. This mammogram over on the left, um, patient A, if there's a new mass here that would be white, it would be much easier to pick up than in patient D where the breast tissue itself is a lot of whiteness. To see a new white you know, circle here would be more challenging. And here's another set of pictures, another set of examples, just to show you again, these are four different women. Um, and again, on the left, this is not dense. These two pictures on the left, we would call these not dense. And then the two pictures on the right, these women, we would say that they do have dense breast tissue. Um, I will add that this, whether someone is dense or not dense, it's an imperfect science. Um, it's subjective, meaning it's really in the eye of the beholder. Um, so one radiologist may disagree slightly with another radiologist, um, especially if someone is sort of borderline. You know, there are certain people, like this one all the way on the right, I don't think any radiologist would disagree that this person is dense. And I don't think anyone would ever disagree that the two on the left are not dense. Um, this one sort of in the middle, this is where sometimes we disagree with each other. Um, and there are computer programs out there that have been created, um, artificial intelligence, to try to address this issue. But I think from what I've seen from the computer programs, they are also imperfect. Um, and I th actually think that humans for now do a better job of assessing breast density. Um, I can tell you that at our practice at IPARC, uh, we tend to err on the side of calling women dense rather than not dense. Um, and I can go into why that is. It's mainly because women who are dense, um, they can choose to get an ultrasound if they would like. And so we don't, by calling them not dense, it makes it harder for them to get the ultrasound covered by insurance. And we don't want to make that um, a challenge for anybody. So if a person is in between, we would rather call them dense, um, have them be able to get the ultrasound if they would like. But again, density is very subjective. It's imperfect, and one person compared to another can sort of evaluate it and come to different conclusions in some cases. 
Again, sorry to belabor the point, but one more example. So the two pictures on the left, these are of a woman who does not have dense breast tissue. You know, if she had a new finding, um, a change on her mammogram, it would be much easier to pick up on than the woman whose breasts we have on the right side. You can see that she is dense. There's a lot of white on this picture. If there was a new white mass, it would be harder to see because it's white on top of white. Um, so why um, do we care so much about this? Um, we really care because, you know, my job is to find a cancer, find a new um, mass when it's small. For the patient on the right, it's harder to do that. Um, but we have come up with some tools to make our lives easier, to make it possible to find things, even in a woman who has dense breast tissue. One of the things I already touched on briefly is ultrasound. Um, another tool that we have is 3D mammography or tomosynthesis. And so what exactly does that mean? So up until recently, we did all mammograms as 2D mammograms. Um, and only recently have we started to do 3D mammograms. Um, this is just to reiterate basically what I already touched on, which is that with mammograms, um, normal breast tissue can look white, but cancer can also look white. So it can make it hard to see a cancer, it can obscure a cancer. The flip side of that is also true. Um, women who are more dense, who have more whiteness on their mammogram, it can um, make it actually harder for us in that we may see something that we think looks abnormal, but when we evaluate it further, we realize, oh, it's just the normal breast tissue. So it can also cause what's called a false positive, meaning we may read a person's mammogram and think that there might be an abnormality. We may call them back to take a closer look at that area and at the end of the day decide that was not actually a mass or anything worrisome. It was just the normal breast tissue that sort of stood out on the mammogram. So breast density can um, create confusion in both directions. And so tomosynthesis or 3D mammograms are one of the ways that we try to help ourselves. So what is tomosynthesis? It's basically a 3D breast imaging tool. Um, it's relatively new. It was only approved by the FDA in 2011. But even in, um, just in the past 10 years, it's already gained widespread use. And we use it on pretty much every patient who comes into IPARC. Um, and I would say that most breast imaging facilities, probably every single breast imaging facility in Connecticut, um, does this as a standard uh, part of their work. Um, the reason we love 3D mammograms is that they have helped us greatly. Um, they have improved on all of the limitations that we have with 2D mammography. So, and this gets a little bit technical, but with 3D mammograms, we have a lower what we call recall rate, meaning we call fewer patients back from their screening mammograms um, because we're better able to tell with the 3D pictures that something is not worrisome than we were before with 2D mammograms. With the 3D mammogram, we also have a higher what's called cancer detection rate, which means we find more cancers. Um, and this is particularly helpful in women who have dense breast tissue. Um, the reason for it is based on how 3D mammograms work. So this is a cartoon that shows at the bottom here sort of sandwiched in between these two paddles is a patient's breast. And then overhead, um, arching from left to right is a camera or the x-ray tube. This takes the pictures in a 3D mammogram and it creates a set of, you know, 90 to 100 pictures um, that get created and sent over to our computers for us to look at. So instead of just looking at four pictures um, total for a woman, we could look at 400 pictures almost for a, that same woman with the 3D mammogram. So it's an imperfect analogy, but I sort of compare it to reading the cover of a book versus actually flipping through the pages of a book. So with a 3D mammogram, because we get so much more information, we get so many more pictures um, through each segment of this breast, we're able to really flip through the pages of a book rather than just look at the cover of it. So that helps us a lot. What I do want to stress, though, um, it seems like this should be a lot more radiation because we're taking so many more pictures, um, but it actually is not um, because the pictures are each individual picture 
is much, much less um, radiation than each individual picture on a 2D mammogram. So that in total, at the end of the day, um, there actually isn't much of a radiation difference between a 3D mammogram and a 2D mammogram. So we do occasionally get some women who have radiation concerns who request that they have a 2D mammogram rather than a 3D mammogram. And, you know, I think it makes sense logically. You would think fewer pictures, it should be less radiation. But because of the physics behind it, it's actually not a significant difference in radiation. And I would say that actually, if you're concerned about radiation dose, I would do a 3D mammogram instead because you have a better chance of not having to have any extra pictures done. Um, this is just one example of um, how 3D mammograms can be helpful. So all the way on the left, this is one picture of a woman's breast. This was her 2D mammogram. Um, and then she also, in addition, had a 3D mammogram performed. And these are some of those slices of that 3D mammogram. You know, I mentioned we can look at up to like 90 or 100 slices for one um, picture. So this is just at four slices that we, I selected. Um, and you can see in this yellow box here, this is um, magnified to show you that there's actually a mass hiding in here. Um, that in this example for this patient, you can see much more easily on the 3D pictures um, than you could see it's actually hiding in here on the 2D mammogram picture. I would say it's not impossible to see this one, but the 3D mammogram picture makes it so much easier, so much less likely to be missed. And so that's why we like 3D mammograms. Um, this is maybe a little bit repetitive, but again, just to go over it really quickly, because I think this is so important. Um, we care about breast density, and it's so important because um, I mentioned the false positives and the false negatives, meaning that um, when there is dense breast tissue, it can either hide a uh, cancer because of it's white on white, or it can lead to false positives, meaning we call someone back for an area that we think might be abnormal, but then it turns up being just the patient's normal breast tissue. So those are two things that um, can happen with more dense breast tissue. The other thing that I didn't mention yet is that actually having dense breast tissue in and of itself risk um, increases the risk of having breast cancer, not by a lot, but it is a risk factor. Um, and so, it's really important, I think, for women to know if they have dense breast tissue or not, um, because it can help inform their decisions that they make. Um, one thing is that it can help them make sure that when they get a screening mammogram, they are going to a facility that offers 3D mammograms, which again, most places in Connecticut do. Um, it can also help them decide if they would like to maybe do screening ultrasound, which is something else that we offer at iPARC. And I would say that almost every place in Connecticut will also offer screening ultrasound. So let's talk a little bit about breast ultrasound. Just like for mammograms, we can do screening ultrasounds and we can also do diagnostic ultrasounds. Um, so a screening ultrasound, for most women, they choose to have it on the same day as their screening mammogram. Um, our technologists where I work at iPARC perform the screening ultrasound study, they are excellent. I cannot stress how good our ultrasound technologists are. Um, they will image both breasts, the entirety of both of the breasts, and they also look at the armpit area or the axilla where the lymph nodes are located. Um, they take pictures of every area of the breast and they send them over for us radiologists to look at on our computers. If there's ever an area that's in question, we will call the patient back so that we can look at it ourselves. Um, there are some facilities that use automated breast ultrasound, which is done by a computer. Um, it doesn't really take that much less time for the patient. It's just sort of performed differently. But I think in Connecticut, we're really lucky because we have been doing screening ultrasound for so long. Um, we were the first state in the US to start doing screening ultrasound. Um, and because of that, we are, I think, pretty good at it. Um, having worked in the Midwest where they didn't really do a lot of screening ultrasound, I can tell you that we are really good at it in Connecticut and our technologists are really good at it. 
Um, and so we prefer to do just handheld ultrasound, meaning the technologist takes the images um, and sends them to us radiologists to look at, and then we call the patient back if there's ever an area that we're questioning. So that's screening ultrasound. Um, diagnostic ultrasound is, again, just like with mammograms, it's to evaluate a particular area. Um, it's for a woman who has a particular symptom, like if they're feeling a lump or they have pain or nipple changes, um, or if there's an area on the mammogram that we wanted to get another look at, ultrasound is a really good way for us to look at the breast tissue. And so usually, you know, mammograms and ultrasounds go hand in hand. They help us, um, they help each other, honestly. And so these are just some examples of what ultrasounds look like. Um, up on the very top, this is the patient's skin up here. Um, and then beneath the skin in this area is the patient's breast tissue. And the breast tissue is again composed of fatty tissue, which is this more gray area, and then the fibroglandular tissue, which is the white area here. And we can see that really nicely with the ultrasound. And then a little bit deeper, this area here is the um, chest wall muscle. This is the pectoralis muscle, the pec. And then this down here, these are, this is the patient's rib and the start of the lungs in the very back. Um, this is a similar uh, type of image. Again, um, this is the skin up here. This area in the middle of the picture is the breast tissue. And then all of this is really the chest wall and the lungs. And you can see the breast tissue looks very different on ultrasound than it did with a mammogram. But again, we use both of these tools. They go hand in hand to help us um, look at the breast tissue. And yet again, this is another set of pictures. And this area here at the level of the skin, this is actually the patient's nipple. And so we can get a good look at the nipple with ultrasound as well. So what are some of the things that we look for on ultrasound? Um, well, a lot of times we see cysts. Um, this the black oval here, this is a cyst, which is benign, meaning it's not cancerous, it's not worrisome. And we can tell with good confidence on ultrasound that that's what this is and that we don't need to worry about it. Um, on a mammogram, we can't necessarily tell that something is a cyst. We can just tell that there is something in the breast tissue there and that we need to look at it with an ultrasound to be able to figure out what it is exactly. Um, these two pictures, this on the bottom and this on the right, these are masses. Um, they can look all sorts of different ways on an ultrasound. Um, a lot of times they're a darker color um, and we look at their shape, we look at their borders. That um, helps us decide if it is something that needs to be biopsied or if it's something that we can follow or something that we don't need to worry about at all. And so ultrasound is very, very helpful. I mentioned that we also look at the armpit or the axilla on an ultrasound uh, when we do screening ultrasound. Um, and that's where we see lymph nodes. And just because this has been sort of a popular topic recently and something that has come up a lot with a lot of our patients, um, when now that we've a lot of women have been getting the COVID vaccine, we have noticed that um, with our practice, a lot of women have lymph nodes that get bigger from the COVID vaccine. And so these pictures are actually out of an article that is about to be published um, from a, an academic center that looked at lymph nodes in women who had received the COVID vaccine. And you can see this is a picture of a woman who had um, her ultrasound 19 days after getting her, ultrasound, after getting her vaccine. Um, this lymph node here was thought to be a little bit big. The doctors thought it was probably from the vaccine and so they had her come back. Um, and 100 days after her vaccine, she came back for her ultrasound and you can see her lymph node, this gray area here got much smaller and looks much, this looks normal. Um, and so this was related to her vaccine. I bring this up because we have um, seen this, you know, um, at our practice too, because so many women have been getting their screening ultrasounds soon after getting their COVID vaccine. And in the beginning, we were suggesting to women that maybe they could hold off on getting their mammogram or getting their ultrasound um, for a couple weeks after the vaccine. We now know, now that we've had more time to research this, that lymph nodes can stay big for 
months after the vaccine. And so we don't um, ask that any patient hold off on getting their imaging. We want them to come in for their mammogram, come in for their ultrasound, um, not put it off for any booster. Um, and if the lymph nodes do look big on the mammogram or the ultrasound, we can just follow them. We know that with time they will go back down to normal. Um, and so we can just, it's something that we can keep an eye on, but we don't want to delay imaging because of the COVID vaccine. And so that was a big steep learning curve for us. Um, no one really knew what to do with everyone getting the COVID vaccine and how it would affect mammograms and ultrasounds. But now that we do know, um, I think it's a good idea for women not to delay and to come in for their imaging. Um, so lastly, I do want to talk about breast MRI. Um, not every woman gets a breast MRI, um, but I think a lot of women probably have questions about it. Um, so like ultrasound, it is considered a supplement, meaning um, it is something that we do for most women in addition to mammogram. It doesn't replace getting the mammogram. Um, MRI is, a, is our most sensitive imaging tool, meaning that it finds honestly the most cancers. Um, but on the flip side, it is, um, what we call less specific, meaning that it can find things that are not cancer. So it can be confusing for us sometimes. Um, it's very good at finding cancer, but it can also find things that may look like cancer or make us worried about possible cancer that aren't cancer, that are benign. So it can lead to more testing and it can lead to more biopsies and that can be the downside of it. Um, so it's not something that at this time we're doing for all women. Um, breast MRI is really used only in specific scenarios for now. And some of those scenarios are um, for screening breast MRI, it's really for women who are at high risk. How we define that is a woman um, who has greater than 20% lifetime risk. So in their lifetime, more than 20% risk of having breast cancer. Um, this is not most women. This would be for women who have a certain gene mutation. I'm not sure if you may have heard of the BRCA or the BRCA mutation. There are a couple other mutations out there that we know that put women at high risk. Um, and the women who have these mutations know about it because maybe the, a family member got genetic testing or maybe they themselves got genetic testing after a family member had breast cancer. Um, so those women are recommended to get screening breast MRI. Um, also, any woman who's had radiation to their chest for having lymphoma in the past, um, they are at high risk. And so for those women, we recommend screening breast MRI. Um, and then some women, they don't know of any particular gene mutation, probably because we don't, we don't know enough as a medical community yet. We don't know all the gene mutations out there. Um, so they don't have any known gene mutation, but they have a very strong family history of breast cancer. So multiple um, first degree relatives, meaning mother, or sister, if they have multiple family members with breast cancer, they may be at high risk. And so for those women, we also suggest that they get a breast MRI. Um, one other group that I didn't list here are women who have had biopsies in the past um, that have shown what we call atypia, um, meaning that they didn't have a breast cancer, but they had something in um, their biopsy that indicated they may be at a higher risk in the future of having breast cancer. And so for these groups of women, we do recommend a screening breast MRI. And this is really to be done in addition to the mammogram. It doesn't replace the mammogram. Um, some other reasons to have a breast MRI, um, some of the reasons we do them are for women who are having a particular symptom, usually nipple discharge that we can't find an answer for with a mammogram or an ultrasound. Um, Sometimes women get a breast MRI after they've been diagnosed with breast cancer and if they're getting chemotherapy. And those are very particular scenarios. Um, this is what it looks like to get a breast MRI. Um, the woman has to lie face down on the MRI table. Um, we do give them a little pillow to rest their head on and their forearms have to come forward. They're, they sort of rest on their elbows. Um, and their chest gets rests on this, um, what we call a breast coil here. This is made of usually like a firm plastic um, and the patient's breasts hang down 
and then the patient goes gets rolled into the um, the MRI magnet, this tube here. Um, the MRIs can take up to 30 to 40 minutes to complete, um, and it's hard for some women because you have to hold still the whole time. Um, we do also inject contrast. So what that means is that um, before you start your MRI, the technologist will put an IV into your arm. Um, they will put you on the MRI scanner. They will position you. They will take some initial pictures. And then after a little bit, they will inject contrast through that IV, and then they will take more pictures. Um, that is essential for us to be able to read the breast MRI. Um, and this contrast, though, is different from the contrast that we use for CAT scans. So some people have al um, allergic reactions to contrast dye from a CAT scan, but that's really different. It's a totally different medication, um, totally different contrast agent than what we use for MRIs. It's really rare to have an allergy um, to the contrast that we use for a breast MRI. So it's the I, the contrast itself is well tolerated, but sometimes the study is hard for women because it can take so long. It can be 30 to 40 minutes. Um, just really briefly, because of that, because it's a study that takes so long, yet at the same time, MRI can be so helpful. Um, what is now um, coming out um, is something called abbreviated breast MRI. Basically, this is a shortened breast MRI study. We don't do quite as many images. Um, and so the study takes a lot less time. It can take as little as 10 minutes, sometimes maybe up to 12 minutes. Um, and it's really intended for women who are maybe not quite very high risk, so they're not over 20% risk, but sort of in an intermediate category. You know, they may have one family member. Um, they may have um, had an, a sort of atypical breast biopsy result in the past. Um, and they have dense breast tissue, meaning their mammogram is harder to read. These are the women who um, so far have been studied in terms of abbreviated MRI, and, and for these women, it has been shown to be a useful study. Um, the downside is that because it's new, um, because it's really only now gaining traction and only now are the research studies coming out about it, um, it's not covered by insurance yet. It takes many years for us to get insurance coverage for a lot of what we do in medicine. We have to prove that it's helpful um, and that can take time. Um, so it's usually an out-of-pocket expense for women. It may still be less than your deductible, even if you have insurance coverage for a regular MRI. Um, and then there are still questions about abbreviated MRI. You know exactly how often should a woman be having it? Um, you know, every couple of years, do you really need to have it every year? Um, so there's still a lot that we need to research about this, um, but it's one of the newest things in breast imaging. Um, at IPARC, we are just about to start our abbreviated breast MRI program for women who are interested, who maybe don't want to do the 30 to 40 minute full study um, and have an abbreviated breast MRI. I think it's a good option. It has been shown in studies to be just as good as the standard MRI, honestly. Um, so I don't think that there are many downsides, but it's something to talk about a little bit more in detail with your breast surgeon or the radiologist um, before going ahead and signing up for it. Um, and then, so in summary, I think I've been speaking for a long time. Um, I want everyone to remember that really the reason why we do mammograms, the reason why we do ultrasounds is that finding cancer early really makes a difference. My job um, is to find a cancer when it's small, when it hasn't spread, and we can do that best with mammogram ultrasound MRI to find it before you can feel it. That really makes a difference um, in women's lives. And then we talked a lot about 3D mammograms, how they have helped us and how they have improved our work compared to 2D mammograms. Um, and it really should be standard at most places in Connecticut now to do 3D mammogram. And then I also just talked briefly about screening ultrasound, screening breast MRI, and how for some women this can also be really helpful, especially women with dense breast tissue. And I think that's about it. Um, I hope that this was helpful and not too much detail, and I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any.
Dr. Borman, thank you so much. I think it certainly gave us a lot of food for thought and it kind of explained things in really terms that were really clear. So thank you, I think that's so valuable. Um, we'll wait for a couple of questions to come in, but I have a question. Um, how often um, or really when should women start getting mammograms? I know that's sort of a moving target these days with different uh, reports coming out, but what are your recommendations? Yes, so this is sort of a controversial topic um, in that there's disagreement among different types of doctors about those recommendations. Um, as breast imagers, as women who do this all day, every day, we agree with the um, breast surgeons um, that mammograms should happen starting at age 40 for average women, average risk women. Um, so we would say start at 40 and have a mammogram once a year. Um, there are some other groups out there who say that you can wait until 50 to have a screening mammogram and that you can have one every year or every other year. Um, what I want women to understand is that every society of doctors, all the doctors, um, no one disagrees on the fact that starting at 40 and having a mammogram every year saves the most lives. There is no disagreement on that. I think the disagreement comes um, about the downsides of mammograms. The downside is that you may get called back um, for extra pictures or an ultrasound. You may get um, end up having a biopsy and being told that your results are benign, not cancer. And so um, the groups, the doctors who recommend against having a mammogram starting at 40 and against having one every year really, um, I think, focus on the downsides. And I think every woman should choose for themselves. Um, so if to you, the chance of getting called back and the anxiety of coming in for a mammogram is not a big deal or not something that you can't overcome, then I think that that's really the only downside to having it every year. Um, if that's okay with you, then I would suggest coming in every year because no one disagrees about the fact that having a mammogram every year, starting at 40, saves the most lives. And that's what that's why I do what I do. And so that's why I recommend starting at 40 and coming every year because we want to find it when it's smaller. Um, so, but yeah, I can talk for an hour on that topic alone. <laughs> yeah, it's so important because really early detection and small breast cancers are treatable and curable, so so important. Could you just talk for a minute about women who have had breast cancer, now come in for their mammogram, are feeling pretty anxious, what advice would you have to offer them? Um, we know that that can be really an anxiety provoking time for women. Um, first of all, so where I work, um, we try to look at mammograms for those women while they're there, um, just so that they don't have to go home and wait to get results in the mail a couple of days later. So we try to look at them while they're at our facility. Um, the technologist will still do the same four sets of pictures. Um, you, they don't really do anything differently. Um, they may, if you've had some scarring from surgery, have to um, do an extra picture or two just to make sure that they get the whole area of the breast in the picture. Um, and we can on the mammogram see changes that are related to surgery um, because even if your surgeon leaves you almost an, impercep an imperceptible scar, you know, sometimes we can barely see the scar on the patient's skin, but we can see changes in the mammogram. Um, we're always looking for those um, and making sure that they look just like changes from surgery and not changes of a breast cancer. Um, I know it's it's stressful for women when they come in after um, they've had cancer. I think if you're at a facility where the doctor is able to read it while you're there, I think that's something that you can take advantage of. Um, a lot of our patients will also in that setting get an ultrasound because that's another good way to look at the breast tissue. So I think that's also something that women could consider doing in addition. Um, and then I think that's basically it. We always we're basically just looking as we would at any other woman to make sure that we don't miss something subtle, something small. Do you think that there's any role for people taking an Advil or Tylenol beforehand? Does that help reduce some of the discomfort or is that sort of a? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, you know, for biopsies, we recommend that women take Tylenol, um, but that's so much more um, 
involved than a mammogram. I think that this has been studied and I can't recall off the top of my head, but I don't think that there has been, you know, you know, in surveys that they've done of women that there has been much of a reported like improvement um, for women who have tried taking Advil or Tylenol beforehand. So I don't know that it necessarily helps. Um, is it is it bad to try? I don't think so. Um, but you just have to make sure that, you, you know, no liver problems, no kidney problems, but it's OK to take Tylenol and Advil. I yeah. just don't know that it would necessarily help that much. Right, right. Anything else that you're sort of wanting to say that you didn't get to say in your talk? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> what did I? Um, I would say. Um, hmm. And I apologize to interrupt, but I'm Mary. I'm not sure if you see, but we do have a number of questions coming in. Uh, so I just want to I want to try to get through some of these, not to put you on the spot, Dr. Boramond. That's no, OK. Um, I can actually see them, too. I can't see them at all. So you guys go ahead, please, ladies. OK, Dr. Boramond, if you want to go through them, uh, I think that would be <laughs> that's your area of expertise. Sure. So I'm just going to go in time order. Um, some the first question is when a report is questioned or a known error is on a report, are the images reviewed again? Not specifically just a breast mammo ultrasound or MRI, but any radiology reports. Um, so if there's an error on a report, um, certainly we would look at it again. Um, I think in breast imaging, occasionally we make um, we might make a side error, like someone might accidentally say, you know, there's a finding in the right breast. Um, uh, when the patient comes back, we have mul in, in our practice, we have multiple sort of um, uh, checkpoints where someone would catch that error. Um, the person who's calling the patient would looks at our report and can see um, that maybe in one part we said right and in another section we said left. And so they would bring that to our attention. Um, or if the patient does get called back and they come back in, we would catch the error at that time. Um, that's really the main error that I've seen that we occasionally make in breast imaging um, or the referring surgeons, our surgeon might call us and say, hey, I think you maybe said the wrong side. Um, so certainly if that is brought to our attention, we always look at the images all over again to make sure that um, that was an error and to make sure we know what the error was and fix it. Um, and so I, I would say, you know, at this point in my career, I'm actually only doing breast imaging, but in the past, you know, if there was ever an error that was brought to my attention, we certainly would look at all of the images again. Um, the second question, if a heart um, watchman, I think maybe they mean pacemaker or loop, loop recorder is put into someone, what happens to breast imaging? That's a really good question. Um, we do often see pacemakers and loop recorders on the mammogram pictures. Um, we See, generally they're on the left side is where the cardiologists usually place them. Um, for a pacemaker, we see them in the upper part, um, sometimes over the armpit area. Um, they can sometimes affect the mammograms. And in those cases, we ask our technologists to take an extra picture um, where they sort of push the pacemaker out of the way um, and try to get just as much of the breast tissue as they can. So sometimes um, women with pacemakers may get an extra picture. Um, with the loop recorder, it's sort of more, it's in a different location. It's in the inner part of the breast. Um, and one of the great things is that we always get two pictures of each breast. So it doesn't actually end up um, obscuring very much of the breast tissue because we always have the second picture um, that we can refer to. So at, we always are cognizant of them and our techs do try to um, position the breast so that we're able to see as much of the breast tissue anyway. So generally, I wouldn't worry if you have a cardiac device or some other um, uh, monitoring device. It, it will, we will be able to still read your mammogram and look at the breast tissue effectively. Um, if a calcification is inside a dense area, how is it found? So that's really good question. Um, so calcifications are really tiny um, white dots on a mammogram. And um, we actually, from even for women with dense breast tissue, we're generally able to see them pretty well. 
Um, it can be sometimes a little bit harder with dense breast tissue, um, but most of the time we can still see them. Um, and if we ever see calcifications on a screening mammogram the, um, that are new or are a change or that we're worried about, we will have a patient come back for extra pictures. And that's when we do um, magnification views. They are extra uh, pictures um, that really look um, at the calcifications, give us a really good look at them. Um, so for most women, if you have dense breast tissue, I would say don't worry too much about us not being able to see calcifications. Those we can generally see pretty well. Um, okay. Um, how often, I don't know if I'm going in time order anymore. Um, how often are breast MRIs available for DCIS cancer survivor? Will insurance pay? Um, so if you've had cancer, whether it's DCIS or invasive breast cancer, um, it may depend on what your age when you were diagnosed. The recommendations are for women who were diagnosed with breast cancer um, at age 50 or earlier, that they are considered high risk enough that they should be getting a screening breast MRI. Um, and I think for a lot of our patients who've had a history of breast cancer, that insurance will cover the breast MRI, but I think it does um, depend on different insurance companies. Um, so I would talk to your breast surgeon. I think they will be your best resource. Um, they will be able to tell you, there are a couple things that we would think about. First, was your DCIS um, seen easily on a mammogram? Um, and is your breast tissue dense? If your breast tissue isn't dense and your DCIS was something that we caught right away on your mammogram, you may not benefit a whole lot from breast MRI. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have it, but it may not, um, you know, mammograms may be great for you. Um, if you have dense breast tissue and you've had a history of breast cancer, I would definitely talk to your breast surgeon about um, considering getting breast MRI. Um, so every case is a little bit different, um, but I think your breast surgeon and your radiologist um, are great resources. And so for anyone who has questions, if they come in for their screening mammogram, um, we're happy to always talk to them. Um, just tell our technologist or the person who's taking your pictures that you have a question for the radiologist and we will gladly come and talk to you about it more. Um, but for anyone who's had a history of breast cancer, I'm sure that you're plugged in with your breast surgeon. And I know the breast surgeons we work with at Norwalk, um, Dr. Capassi and Dr. Greenberg, they're so excellent. They would definitely talk to you about it. Um, and I think that they make really good decisions when it comes to when to do a breast MRI or not. Um, it can be complicated, so it's hard to answer, um, you know, without knowing your specific history. But a lot of times it's covered. Um, I think it depends on what your mammogram looks like, what your surgical, your breast cancer history was. Um, so talk to your breast surgeon and talk to us for some more details. Um, another question, do mammograms cover all of the axilla area? They do not. Um, so they cover part of it, but not all of it. With a screening ultrasound, our technologists look at all of the axilla, the armpit area. Um, but I don't want you to fret about that, honestly. Um, it's incredibly rare for us to um, find a breast cancer that has spread to a lymph node without being able to see the breast cancer or some other abnormality on the mammogram itself. So most of the time for a woman who gets called back because of something in the axilla or the armpit area, it ends up being nothing, um, nothing worrisome. So I wouldn't fret about the fact that we can't see all of the armpit um, in the mammogram. Um, do MBC patients still need screenings? What does MBC stand for? Do you know, Mary? Metastatic breast cancer. Okay. Um, so we generally don't do screening in this scenario. Um, again, it's something your breast surgeon will ultimately decide. Um, I have seen it in rare instances. Um, uh, but it depends on um, your overall course. If you um, are on chemotherapy, how you've responded, if the tumor anywhere else in the body has completely gone away, um, then maybe your surgeon might recommend that you come in or your oncologist might recommend that you come in for a mammogram, but they will know your case best. And so I would touch base with your oncologist um, who will be able to tell you if a mammogram is going to be helpful in your scenario. 
We have so many women that are living longer with a metastatic disease, so I think we'll probably be having that question more and more. It's really such a good one. Yeah. And they're closely followed by their medical oncologists and breast surgeons, so you're correct. Absolutely, it will be an ongoing discussion. Um, if a person has a high family history of breast cancer but didn't inherit a hereditary cancer gene from either parent, do you recommend they still wait until age 40 to get their baseline mammogram? This is a really, really good question. So if you are high risk, or as in um, if you have multiple family members who've had breast cancer, um, what the American College of Radiology actually recommends is that you have what's called a formal risk assessment um, by at about the age of 30, 30 to 35. What that means is that you sit down with somebody who knows about breast cancer and breast cancer screening and the risk factors, and they go through all of your risk factors. They go over all of your family history um, and they help you decide if you are high risk or not. Um, you know, some of the things that might make you high risk, we don't even necessarily think about all the time. Um, it can be cancers other than breast cancer. Um, so the recommendation really is actually that women, and this is not something that most people do yet, hopefully it will catch on, but that all women who um, think they might be high risk, really all women should have a risk assessment in their 30s um, to see if they are high risk and if they would benefit from starting mammograms or MRIs before age 40. Um, because for women who do have a genetic mutation that we know about, we actually do start their screening before age 40. Um, so it may be that you would benefit from screening before 40. So um, what this means for you, like in practical terms, is um, look for a high risk breast clinic. So for us at Norwalk, um, our patients are seen in the breast surgery office, um, either by the breast surgeons or the APRNs who work with them, who are able to do that risk assessment for the patient and talk to them about their options um, and if they should start screening before, um, before age 40 or not. So that's really good. If you have multiple family members, I would strongly advise um, that you um, have your primary care doctor or your OBGYN give you a referral to the breast surgery clinic or another high risk clinic to discuss your case. Um, what makes a calcification a worry versus not a worry? Um, so it really depends on how it looks on the extra pictures that we do. Um, we look at their shape. Uh, we look at um, their distribution, whether they're grouped or they're spread out. Um, we look to see if they're a change on the mammogram. We look to see if the woman has lots of calcifications in other places. So it really, um, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Some of them on the extra pictures, we can tell for sure are benign and not to worry about them. Um, some of them we are become very concerned about based on how they look, but a lot of times calcifications fall into sort of this middle category. Um, where we can't say that they're nothing and we can't say that, oh, come back in six months or come back in a year, um, and we end up having to biopsy them a lot, unfortunately. Um, calcifications can be tricky, but it really depends on how they look. Um, can it be more difficult? Sorry, I'm trying to get through all these. Can it be more difficult to read mammograms in women who've had breast reductions or implants? Okay, good question. Um, so breast reductions, um, we do see changes from the surgery in the breast. We can tell when a woman has had a breast reduction um, and we can see scarring from the surgery, but we still are able to image all of the breast tissue. And so I don't think that it makes our job harder. Um, changes from a breast reduction are very um, typical, like we know what to look for. Um, and so we know what we should be seeing in someone who's had a breast reduction. And so we're generally not fooled by it. Um, so, so I don't think, honestly, that it makes our job that much more difficult. Rarely um, might we call something back if we're not 100% sure that it was just related to scarring from surgery and maybe do some extra pictures just to make sure that it's from the reduction surgery and not something else. Um, for implants, that's a really good question. I didn't cover this, but maybe next time I will. Um, for implants, we actually do extra pictures in women who've had implants. Um, we do twice the number of pictures. The reason for that is that we have to do the regular views where um, you're positioned just like anybody else, and those regular views will include a part of the breast implant. Um, 
And then in addition to those regular views, the technologist will push the implant out of the way. It's called an implant displaced view. So they push the implant aside and they pull just the breast tissue onto the plate to take the picture. And that's um, so that we can see the breast tissue without the implant in the way. Um, sometimes uh, patients, uh, especially if they've had their implant for a while, it can make it harder to push the implant out of the way. And so in those patients, it can be a little bit challenging to get a good look at the breast tissue. Um, so I will say that sometimes for some patients, the implants can make it a little bit harder. Um, I would say if you have breast implants and you have uh, dense breast tissue, I would really recommend if insurance covers it, if it's not a financial issue, um, to go ahead and get screening ultrasound because that way we can make sure that we're really getting all of the breast tissue in the picture. Um, do CAT scans pick up enlarged lymph nodes in the axilla area? The answer is yes, they definitely do. Um, the best way to look at lymph nodes, I would say though, is with ultrasound. Um, it's actually, I think, even better than CAT scans or MRIs. Um, but yes, a CAT scan will definitely be able to see if the lymph nodes are big. I think that was it. I think so. Wow, you did a great job. The questions are really good, so that's really great. Um, thank you so much for spending an hour with us tonight. I know that um, your presentation has been recorded, so people will be able to retrieve it at another time. And I think it's just been so valuable. Thank you so very much. Thank um, you. We look forward to your expertise and making all of our lives better in this community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.